company will fire an explosive valve and bring the regulator online. Next, seven minutes before entry, is crew stage separation. Uh, basically, we fire six more explosive bolts and use large springs to, set, to push the crew stage away from the lander. Uh, at, at this point, uh, the, the stuff on the crew stage is no longer needed, so we discard the crew stage and it burns up in the atmosphere. Entry is the point where the vehicle reaches 125 kilometers in altitude and it just starts to feel the pressure of the atmosphere and starts slowing down. After slowing way down by atmospheric friction at approximately 1.5 times the speed of sound, we'll deploy our parachute. The parachute then slows us down even further, getting ready for, for separation. The, the, the actual time of this event can vary plus or minus 10 seconds due to variations in the atmosphere. After 15 seconds after heat shield jettison occurs, um, we fire, I'm sorry, 15 seconds after parachute deploy happens, we fire six more pyrotechnic bolts to deploy our, our heat shield because it's no longer needed. Lander separation happens after about two more minutes of slowing down on the parachute. This is, happens at approximately 900 meters in altitude. The lander drops out and starts its power descent phase, and this is where it really starts to differ from the previous landers that we've flown. A couple seconds after we separate from the, the back shell, the thrusters warm up, and at this point they're at their maximum performance level toward the final descent phase. We'll do a maneuver to get us away from the back shell and the parachute, and then we'll orient ourselves vertically to land on the surface. After about 40 seconds of powered descent, we then touch down on the surface at a measly 5 miles per hour. So the time we're going to look out for is 4.53 Pacific time, and we should point out in that graphic that all those times were Pacific times. That is correct. Time those are all Pacific time and based on nominal runs right now. Now the team has di various displays to help you visualize some of the things that are going on, correct? That, that's correct, Gay. Um, one of the, some of the clues that we, we use to kind of watch these events occur here, we've got some, some plots that we'll, we'll discuss for you. The first plot is a measurement of the signal that, that Phoenix is transmitting all the way back to Earth, and we're measuring that with a giant radio antenna called Green Bank in Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, the signal is pretty weak by the time it gets to Earth, so we can't really get data from this signal, but what we can tell is that the lander is alive by looking at the, the carrier as it stands above the noise, as you can see here in this plot. The carrier is kind of like hearing a C note ringing continuously. Um, over time, we'll see the carrier as it builds up, and we'll be able to track what it does as a, as a function of time, as you can see on the bottom of this plot here. Another, now, you also have a Doppler That's correct. Okay. Another, another source of data that we've got is, is directly from the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. Uh, Mars Odyssey will, is in an attitude that allows us to get data bounced directly from Phoenix to the, the orbiter and back to Earth in real time, basically. We call that bent pipe. Initially, Odyssey is going to be in a mode where it's recording just raw data signals and sending that back to Earth. And so on the ground, we'll take that raw data and we'll extract again the carrier signal out of that, just like we were doing with Green Bank. Because we know the relative motions between Phoenix and the orbiter Mars, Mars Odyssey, we have a predict, as you can see here in this plot, of the, the corridor that we expect that Doppler profile to be within. Mm -hmm. So we'll be watching over time for the, the, the Doppler to build up. Um, if we can queue it up, you can see the carrier signal staying within the corridor here, um, giving us evidence that we're doing the right thing. Now, there is, there's occasionally some harmonics that show up, just like that C note might have harmonics, and they'll show up as aliases in the, in the plot, so don't, don't get confused by those. Just basically keep track of the carrier as it stays within that corridor. Now, as soon as we p deploy our parachute, uh, we will switch to 32 kilobit per second transmission mode on Phoenix. Now, when we do that, uh, basically, instead of getting raw data back at Earth, we're actually getting true telemetry, or true data. And in that data is going to be a set of uh, altitude and velocity measurements from the lander itself. And we'll be plotting that in real time in this plot here. You can see we'll, see, we'll get attitude as a function of time, in real time with real data from the, from the lander. And so what we want to make sure what happens here is that the lander stays within the white corridor as the predicts show here. Now we have something that's a little different from normal. We have a simulation that the team is using to help visualize where the spacecraft is and what it's doing. That's correct, Gay. We've got what we call a visualization of EDL. 
that will we'll keep in synchronization with the actual events that are going on in order for people to be able to keep track of what the timeline and order of events are and what the condition of the spacecraft is in, at the time. In addition to that, it allows us to, to see our position with respect to the orbiters and evaluate the status of our comm links as, as, we're, as we're going through EDL. Um, from a timing perspective, this simulation is based largely on our nominal predicts that we ran as, of, as late as this morning. Uh, there are some key events in here, though, that are non-deterministic, and when those occur, like parachute deployment or lander separation, I'll be advancing this animation forward when we get confirmation that those events have occurred on the ground. Um, just some highlights about this animation. The, the bright green line that you see here is the... Uh, the Phoenix trajectory or the path that we predict the Phoenix is going to follow. The orbiters, you can see orbiter tracks in here, are each colored. Red is for Mars Odyssey, gold is for Mars Express, and blue is for MRO. The blue-gray lines that you see coming out of Phoenix here are the UHF links back to the orbiters and back to